Welcome to another uh, edition of the Money Button Documentation Series. Today, we're going to talk about different ways to format signatures. So this will be the final part in the sort of the keys and signatures uh, uh, sort of group uh, videos and, and articles. Uh, so the idea of this one is basically there are two common ways you encounter to uh, encode a signature. So we'll talk about both of those different ways. Uh, this would be a little bit shorter than the other ones. Um, let me just, uh, let me start the presentation here and look at that right now. Okay, so uh, basically the prerequisites for those, so I'll, we'll link to these things, but uh, we assume you already know what ECDSA is. So there's a video and an article on that. And we assume that you know what Bitcoin signed messages are. Uh, so there's a, a, a video and an article on that as well. Uh, and basically there are two different ways that you'll see signatures. Um, either in DER format, which is something that you see inside of a Bitcoin transaction, or in compact format, uh, which is used in the Bitcoin signed messages uh, protocol. Um, so just as a really quick reminder, this is a, a, a photo of, uh, from that paper on digital signature algorithm. Technically, this is not what's used in Bitcoin. Bitcoin uses ECDSA, but this, this graphic is so good, it just about perfectly applies to Bitcoin anyway, because you get the idea. First of all, the idea of creating a signature is that you have some type of message, which you then hash, and then using a private key, you sign the hash of the message and you produce a signature. And that's the signature algorithm. That's how you create a signature. There's a way to verify a signature as well. So for anybody who already has your public key, they must have gotten your public key from you or from a trusted third party or something like that somehow. They know who you are. And what they can do is they receive a message from you somehow. Either you send it to them or they get it off the internet or something like that. They perform the same hash function on the, uh, on the message. And they take in the signature that you give them and the public key that they already know is yours. And they can verify the signature and they get either yes or no using the signature verification algorithm. And the details of what this is and all that are in like our ECDSA video and the Bitcoin signed messages video. Now, uh, the, the important thing for what's inside of a Bitcoin transaction is, is this. So basically we see DER formatted signatures. And so a signature consists of two numbers, R and S. Unfortunately, Bitcoin doesn't just put them into the transaction in the simplest way. It uses a more complicated format the reason for this is just this is what OpenSSL used and Bitcoin used OpenSSL. And there are good reasons why OpenSSL formats things this way, because OpenSSL actually supports many different sort of uh, cryptography standards. And so they need standard encoding mechanisms that work for everything. Um, that doesn't really apply to Bitcoin because Bitcoin is just a particular curve and particular hash functions and things like that. So we're kind of stuck with this. This is just how a signature is formatted inside of a transaction. It has a header byte that's always uh, hex 30. Uh, it has uh, a length byte, which indicates the length of everything. Then there's a, a header for the R value, and then there's the length of R. Now the length of R is almost always gonna be 32, but not necessarily. Uh, it could be something like 31 if it's an unusually short value of R, usually 32. Then there's a header for S, the length of S, again, S would be like R in the sense that it's almost always going to be 32 bytes long, but occasionally you might have one that's only 31 bytes or shorter, uh, but that would be rare. So we simply concatenate these values together. And so you get something that is usually slightly longer than 64 bytes, because 64 bytes would be if you just had a 32 byte R and a 32 byte S, it would be 64 bytes. So then some, you have something like, let's see, I see six additional header bytes there so it would be about 70 or so most of the time, maybe slightly less depending on uh, the size of R and S. Now inside of a Bitcoin transaction, there's actually one more thing that you should be aware of. We'll cover all this stuff in more detail when we talk about transactions, but this is just a really brief uh, explanation that uh, we'll come back to and go into a lot more detail about all this stuff. But not only do you have the signature itself, you also have a byte that indicates the way in which the, the uh, transaction was hashed. So you can hash transactions in different ways depending on what you're trying to do. A transaction consists of a number of inputs and outputs, and you have to blank the parts of the inputs that will contain the signature, and you can optionally blank other things. 
And depending on what things you choose to blank and how exactly, uh, you are specifying a different SIG hash. And the different SIG hash options are SIG hash all, SIG hash none, SIG hash anyone can pay, and SIG hash single. And very, very briefly, what this means is SIG hash all means I'm signing the entire transaction, which means that only the only valid version of the transaction is exactly what I specify. SIG hash none means you don't care what the inputs or outputs are. SIG hash anyone can pay means you care about the outputs, but you don't care about the inputs. And SIG hash single means only sign this input and the corresponding output. And again, that probably doesn't make sense to most people, but we'll cover this again when we talk about transactions. But this is just what that extra byte is in a signature inside of a transaction is the SIG hash type. There's one additional complication because Bitcoin SV is derived from Bitcoin Cash or Bitcoin Cash was derived from Bitcoin Core. There's this one uh, gotcha, which is that there's a different, uh, the, the SIG hash byte is different by like a bit than it was uh, originally, which is the SIG hash fork ID. And I don't remember the algorithm exactly, but basically it's, it's not just literally the SIG hash byte. It is that byte and then or with another value. So it's slightly different than what you would expect. Uh, that's one of the minor differences with Bitcoin SV and the original Bitcoin. Of course, we would remind everyone that the other ones are more different, but that's a whole other story. But this is a difference from the original algorithm that the SIG hash uh, fork ID changes what the SIG hash byte is. And uh, so that is just a, a, a difference that, that you should be aware of. And if you look inside the source code of the library, uh, you'll see that that uh, has to be accounted for and that extra uh, information is there. Uh, that was used to create replay protection is, is why that's there. Um, okay, so then at the bottom there, I have an example of a signature that you would actually see inside of uh, a, a, a transaction. Uh, that is the DER encoded signature plus a SIG hash. Uh, this, I think I include the SIG hash byte. Actually, now that I think about it, I'm not sure I remember to include that at the end there, but that is, it's a, it's a DER encoded uh, signature. And so it just looks like hex because that's normally how you'd write it down if you're writing it down in text. Okay, so that was the first way. That's the way that you see it inside of a Bitcoin transaction. The other common way you see signatures, which as we continue to produce sort of off-chain standards that use Bitcoin cryptography, or even standards that are on-chain but inside of an op return and therefore not a part of the like metadata of a transaction, we format signatures differently. And we do this for a number of different reasons, but the best reason is just that, well, DER format's kind of annoying, and there's a better way to format signatures, which is the compact form. And a compact form always has the same length. If it's in binary, it's always 65 bytes because it always has a single byte for something called I or the recovery value. And then R and S are always exactly 32 bytes. This is just a slightly simpler way to encode a signature. Um, the value I, if you go uh, watch the presentation we have on uh, Bitcoin signed messages, I is used to recover the public key from the signature. So it's just a, a single byte. And at the bottom there, I show it in base 64 uh, uh, encoding, because normally when you uh, create a signature that's in compact form in a string, you normally encode it as base 64. So that's it. This is quite technical. This is basically just a way to uh, the, the two different ways you'll see encoding uh, signatures in Bitcoin, either inside of a Bitcoin transaction or uh, uh, and sort of the, like the application layer. And this will probably make more sense when we go into what actually is inside of a transaction and why those things matter. Uh, but I'll give a, a demo, but before I do guys, is there any, any comments or questions about any of the stuff that I just uh, covered there? No, uh, everything we can watch we'll record. I know if you okay. have anything. No, I agree, we can move on. Okay, let me just uh, open my terminal as usual and so what I'll do is I'm just going to quickly basically sign something and just demonstrate both formats of the signature. Um, so as usual here, let me make sure I load the library. And then basically say, so again, I'm going to, uh, as I have in other videos, I'll just start by making a private key. Um, so there's my private key that I've generated randomly. Um, I can do things like well, I won't worry too much about validating the signature because the whole purpose of this is just to show the two different ways to, to format a signature. 
So what I'll do is I will create a message though. We'll say my data is this is my data. And then I'll say, I'm gonna do this slightly simpler than I normally do here. I'll say, uh, uh, here, I'll do it this way. Uh, uh, bsv.crypto.hash.sha256. So in order to create my signature, I'm going to need to hash my data. Um, and there is my hash. Now I can do, I'll uh, get my signature and I'm gonna do it this way. I'm gonna do ecdsa, crypto.ecd to say, that sign with, and I, I just created this new convenience method just to sh show this demo. So there are two different ways I can sign it. Like normally what you would do is, I would just wanna sign my, my hash directly. Um, but I'm gonna do it differently because if I did it that way, I won't have the I value. I want the I value there so I can show two, both different formats of the signature. So now I can do dot two DER and show the DER format of, of the uh, signature. And then I can do the two compact. And that's it. So all I'm doing is these are the two common ways. Now, you don't normally need to use ECDSA directly. So it would be very unusual. Like basically, the only reason to do it this way is to create a demo of using ECDSA. But in practice, you're going to use either, you'll do things like use BSV. Dot, I think it's just dot transaction. Uh, you either use this directly to build transactions and sign them, and we'll demo that later, or you use uh, the whole separate uh, tool we have here called message or Bitcoin signed messages. So normally you would use these tools to build and sign something and you'll just, people should refer to the corresponding videos uh, on those things. But anyway, so that's it. So we just have generated two different ways to encode a signature. And so when you see this show up in Bitcoin, now you understand that there are two different things. Why aren't they the same? That's because they're just formatted differently. And, but it's the same uh, sort of uh, idea under the hood, which is a signature always consists of R and S. So, um, all right, let me just, as usual, let me briefly glance at the documentation uh, before we sort of move on here. Okay, so uh, say the documentation just covers exactly this. So we have things like what is a DER encoded signature? So if you wanna look up at any time, what are the values in there? And then what's the difference between that and a compact signature? And it shows you how to generate them and how to see the difference. So that's basically it. So, uh, you know, so again, this one was super technical, but this is just a different way to format signatures. And some of these pieces will make a whole lot more sense when we talk about transactions. So the next video will be basically, uh, we'll do a number of different videos on transactions because there are a bunch of different things that matter there. So the next one will basically just be an overview that will cover how signatures fit inside of a transaction and a bunch of other things. And then we'll talk through over a period of other videos and, and articles about basically how to build, sign, broadcast transactions and all that thing, as well as uh, script, how to write smart contracts inside Bitcoin, The vastly underappreciated uh, programming language built into Bitcoin. So any comments or questions, guys? Or I got, uh, any, any comments or questions about? So just, just a few comments. Like, I remember in the, I don't remember it was the last video or the previous one, you mentioned basically like, uh, there is two kinds of things that we can sign that is a transactions or anything else. And yes. when we spoke about messages, I believe, it's nice to see that basically why is that? Like there is different formats of signatures. It's not like, something random is actually a justification for that yeah. that is cool yeah. and the other thing is as, as always usually when you are building like higher order applications you don't care about this because basically the libraries take care of that or even money wooden right if you are just making payments with money wooden you don't see anything of this stuff but this is happening like under the under the hood and yeah. it's, it's cool to to understand what is going on and it's cool to understand that it's all these complicated things going around and you just need to to configure stuff and swipe a button and then all these things happen automatically basically yes. yeah 
we're teaching these things so that people can understand what's going on under the hood, but you do not need to actually know all of these things for almost anything that you actually want to build. That's why we created Money Button, that under the hood, Money Button is solving every single one of these problems, that you can just plug Money Button into your website and by copying and pasting code, and your users can just swipe the button. And under the hood, all these problems are solved. So, so, uh, so please visit us at uh, moneybutton.com. You can find links to everything. The documentation itself is at docs.moneybutton.com. We also just today published the first of a series of blog posts that we're creating where you, where you sort of accumulate all this information into blog posts. And uh, so that's at blog.moneybutton.com. We have a YouTube channel, obviously, where all of these videos are. You're, there's a good chance you're watching this on YouTube. Uh, so just Google that. It's youtube.com slash C slash money button. Um, and we have a Telegram group where if you want to talk with us directly and ask questions about money button or about this library, or these videos or anything like that, that is at t.me slash money button help. And again, uh, you can find links to everything at moneybutton.com directly. Uh, so if you forget, just go there and uh, you can find all the links to everything. So, uh, so that's all, and uh, see everybody at the the next one, which will be on transactions. Which we've, pe we we people may not realize it, but we've been doing this in a very orderly way. That we've now built up all of the basic information that you needed to know to actually be able to understand transactions. So, if you watch all these videos and read all these articles, you will have a good understanding of what a Bitcoin transaction is. So, it will no longer be a mystery to people, and that's why we did it in this order. Uh, that these are the prerequisites to understand what a Bitcoin transaction is. And then ultimately to understand what blocks are and what the blockchain is and all that stuff as well. So, okay, and, we'll see. Yeah, go ahead. And if you have any questions, I um, want uh, uh, Ryan to explain something else or more specifically. Uh, you can also feel free to ask. Or if you want Oihei to explain something else, you can feel free to ask. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. On our Telegram group is probably the best place. So t.me slash money button help. Um, okay. All right. Well, then see everybody. Uh, Next time.